We're in a wisdom series. We kicked it off last week. Uh, and man, I am so looking forward to walking through it. And I want to give you kind of a, uh, a, a recap of, of last week because ultimately what we are going to be studying is we're going to be studying some, some wisdom literature or what we've defined more in more modern terms as wisdom literature. The reality is the entire Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, everything about it is meant to encourage and to grow you in your wisdom and understanding and knowledge. But specifically, these books that have come to be known through time as the wisdom literature, we're going to be looking at in the weeks to come. So we're going to be looking at Proverbs and Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes and Job, and we're going to be talking about the common threads and, and what we can glean from all of these things. But before we do, it's always important that we understand the backstory and the context of how we get here, because there's nothing in the Bible that is literally a standalone thing. The, the Bible, though it was written by multiple authors over multiple decades uh, and, and, and hundreds of years and, and throughout different seasons, the reality is they're all a common theme in which they are pointing and referencing each other. They're connected. And though you can read it by itself and it's still rich, when you understand the interconnectivity between God's word and how important and how well thought out it is, it brings out a complete new level of, of richness and depth that I'm excited to be able to see. And, and the wisdom literature specifically is pointing back to so many things that we need to understand. So last week, in the first week of this wisdom series, we spent most of our time in Genesis and, and begin, in the beginning and understanding God had an original intention, that, that wisdom is a thing that God carries, that he is the definer of wisdom, that God knows what is right and good and what is bad. Like He is the person who defines those things, that in creation, he continually and over and over defined what was considered to be good. He, and he also defined what wasn't good, which was for man to be alone. Uh, and so he created this, this opportunity and this understanding of what good is and what wisdom is. And when he created man and he created woman and he asked for them to, to, to rule and reign with them, it says that he planted them in the garden and he gave them an opportunity to reign with him and that their job, their, their reality, what they were supposed to do was that they were supposed to seek God for wisdom, that they were supposed to seek God for wisdom to know how to reign and how to rule. And that this wasn't something that they were created with, that this was something that they were supposed to grow with in the process of maturity. And the way that they could find that wisdom was by, uh, in this reference, we had these two trees. And they had a choice. They could either eat from the tree of life and consume from the knowledge and the wisdom of God that he gives them, or they could eat of this other tree, which was called the knowledge of of good and evil, or the knowledge of good and bad, that this tree represents doing it in your own way, being wise in your own eyes. When we get to Proverbs, that's a saying that comes over and over again. Don't be wise in your own eyes. When you consume of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what you're saying is, is that you want to do it in your own time, in your own process. When we read Genesis 3, 6, which is the story when Eve took that apple, it says that, or that fruit, it says the woman was convinced. She saw that there was a beautiful tree and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. You see, the moment that sin entered, the moment they decided, I'm gonna do what I think is right. I'm gonna consume this tree, even though it's the only thing God told me not to do. It's the only thing God told me not to do. He, he said that I could eat from all trees except from this one. And he didn't give me any other rules. He said, be fruitful and multiply and eat and be in abundance. Just don't eat from this tree, this one tree, the knowledge of good and bad. But in this moment that they, they took this and they, they decided to do this, the thing that was broken before their relationship with God was broken, the intimacy between husband and wife, between man and woman was broken. And as opposed to being naked and unashamed, they are now naked and ashamed and they are fearful to be with each other and they hide things from each other and then they go later and they hide from God. The intimacy that God longed to be with, the result, the way that we gain wisdom, which is intimacy with God, that intimacy was broken because sin entered. And so now we have this reality in which man and woman and God are no longer in an intimate relationship. We have the reality that the relationship was broken and we're now hiding things from each other and we're keeping things apart. And it's, 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 it's the thing that we have to know from moving forward is 
the tree, it, it, nothing is wasted. The reason that the tree is called the knowledge of good and evil or the knowledge of good and bad, knowledge is an important word here. Because knowledge, and especially in the Hebrew context, it doesn't just mean like, hey, I read something about it and I know about it. Or, or like, I, I saw it, I read, I read this thing. Knowledge throughout the entire Bible, especially in the Old Testament, has to do with that knowledge is, is, is an experience. Knowledge is a thing that's experiential. It's not just something you read about or you hear about. It's something that you experience. That's why in the Bible, and in the old King James, it says like, and he knew her. And we would say that's sexually. Like we even sometimes, maybe you grew up, it's like they knew each other, biblically, <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. It, because sex between a man and a woman is not something you read in a book. It's an experience. It is experience. The knowledge of someone is an experience that happens. That the thing that God longed for man and wife, for husband and wife, and between man and woman and Adam and Eve was that they would have the knowledge of each other. That they would have an experience of intimacy between each other. But see, the lie that the enemy gave at the very beginning was that God is holding something back. He doesn't want you to know something. And if you'd eat that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you would be like God. And here's the thing. Some of the worst lies that the enemy gives to you, the most wounding lies are actually not lies at all because it's actually true. He said, God's keeping something from you. He's keeping knowledge from you. And it was true. God was keeping knowledge the knowledge of bad from his kids. Because at this point, everything that Adam and Eve had consumed was from God's goodness. And the only knowledge they knew was how good God was, and that's all God intended them to have. And whenever they said he's keeping you, he was keeping evil from his kids. But the moment that they took that, intimacy was broken, and they experienced and understood what it meant to be bad. And the result of doing things in our, uh, that it seems right to us, man's wisdom will constantly, throughout history, the result will be broken relationships, pain, and ultimately leading to death. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve, and that's exactly what we see throughout the entire biblical account and throughout the entire historical account, that when we do something, even if it seems like it makes sense, the result is broken relationships, pain, and death. And so God's defined what knowledge is, and God's defined what wisdom is, and God is and lives in the very characteristics of who it is. But, but we need to understand that there is a, another way. There was a promise of a seed, that a seed is coming. And if you keep going... And throughout this idea, that promise was confirmed to Abraham. And we don't have time to really talk about Abraham today. But here's the thing. God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Through your seed, all the nations will be blessed. There is still a hope of intimacy that I long to be with you and an intimacy that will result in understanding and wisdom and how you're supposed to rule and reign here with me. And so he gives this promise to Abraham. But the reality is Abraham has no kids and he doesn't know how it's going to happen. And so his wife has this idea in which she sees that she has a servant, and she says, if you just sleep with my servant, the, the reality is maybe you can have the promise fulfilled through her. And if you look at the story uh, in, in Genesis chapter 16, and we don't have time to go through all of it, but the language that's used in Genesis 16 is the same language that's used when Eve saw the fruit. It's the same language, because it's the same story of thinking that they know what's best that God said to do it one way and saying, I don't know how God's going to do it, but I see a way I can do it myself. In fact, the phrase, when Adam said, I listened to the woman you gave me, is the exact same phrase that Abraham said about his wife. When she said, take this woman and sleep with her. It's the same language. All the, it's all garden language. It's all the fall language. It's all the exact same story, which is, and it, you, it keeps going on because they end up having that son, and that ends up being the greatest problem that the nation of Israel has uh, from, from political and socioeconomic. To this day, they still deal with the consequences of that one decision. And, and as a result of that, it says that they were harsh to her. She was an Egyptian woman, and wouldn't you know it, later the Egyptians have dominion over the Israelites. And also wouldn't you know that they tried in their own way and then God says, that's not the son of the promise. I'm going to give you Isaac. And then the moment that he gives Isaac is the, it's a very short time later that he says, now I'm going to need for you to pay for the thing that you did on your own. And I'm requiring the life of your son. Because you already went and did it on your own. 
and all things have a payment. And it wasn't until Abraham trusted God and walked in the fear of God that God provided a way that wasn't there in the ram in the thicket. And he said, We're still, I'm going to give you a grace that covers. And we have a new language, a new thing that's starting to happen. But that's not who we're talking about today. We're just getting set up. And I don't have a lot of time. Who we're talking about today is the man that the Bible says is the wisest man to ever live. King Solomon. But you see, King Solomon, who's the son of David, who's the son of David, and not just the son of David, not like, oh, David, there was this great guy. He was the son, of, and his mom was the woman who David saw when he was supposed to be fighting, and she was bathing, and he took her, and he slept with her, and then she became pregnant, and to cover up his steps, he had her husband murdered, and then tried to, was, this is the son of Bathsheba, this is the son of sin, this is the son of one of David's greatest failures. This is the son that came right after David lost the first child that he impregnated Bathsheba with. And Solomon comes around. He wasn't technically supposed to be the heir. He wasn't technically the next born. He wasn't technically the oldest. But it was the one that God chose, that he chose Solomon. And he told David that this descendant that I'm going to give you is going to build a permanent dwelling place for me. And that through his seed, salvation will come. Something is coming. I'm trying to make a way where there was no way. I'm still trying to get back to the idea of what I originally intended, my original design, which was relationship with you, that I want to be with you and I want to dwell with you and I want to be in intimacy with you. And through your seed, David, through your seed, David, there's going to be a, there's going to be a way. And then all of a sudden we have Solomon. And in verse, or in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, verse 3, we start to pick up this story of Solomon. And we're going to see that Kings gives us a two-sided tale of who Solomon is because he's faced with two decisions. Do I eat from the tree of life or do I eat from the knowledge of good and evil? Well, we're going to dig in today and we're going to see what it says. So in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Solomon, this is important, Solomon loved the Lord. Solomon loved God. Do you know that in the entire Bible, there are very few characters that it says that, that they loved God? There's people who are afraid of him. There's people who worshiped him. There are people who feared him. There are people who served him. But there's very few people in the Bible that it says they loved God. Solomon loved God and followed all the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifice and burnt incense at the local places of worship. The local places of worship, it's, it's, it actually, if you go back to the Hebrew, it says that he worshiped and he offered sacrifices on the high places. If you've watched our Rudy series, God's always trying to meet with God and man on high places because that's getting back to Eden. It's getting back to the garden. It's getting back to the intention. And Solomon offered sacrifices on the high places. We don't have time to look at it, but he offered like thousands and thousands and thousands of sacrifices. He loved God. He loved God. And as we read through this, I want you to see, not just from Rudy, but I want you to see how much garden and Eden verbiage is here because within this story everything about Solomon's story which is pointing back to the garden is going to help us understand the context in which Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon were written it's going to help us better understand some of the verbiage and some of the stories as they go so here's what happens in, in, in chapter in verse 6 Solomon has this thing that maybe you've dreamed about or at least I did God showed up to Solomon and said I'm going to give you anything you ask for it's like Aladdin, and he says, anything you want, I'll give you. And Solomon doesn't ask for more wishes, which is great. That was a good choice. But he asked for something more important. It says in verse 6, you've shown me great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You've continued this greatness to him and gave him a son, myself, to sit on his throne this very day. This is where important, though. It says, now... Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child, and I don't know how to carry out my duties. 
Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between tov and ra, between good and bad. For who is able to govern this great people? I love this because he says, I don't know what I'm doing. He's an adult. He says, I'm like a child. Wisdom is not something you are born with. Wisdom is something that you gain through knowledge and experience. And he says, I am too young to understand and know how to rule. And he has this decision. I can either try to do what is right in my own eyes. I can try to live by what I've seen. I can try to live by what I think is right. Or in this moment, we see Solomon choosing because he loves God. I'm going to consume the fruit that comes from relationship and intimacy with you. So as a child, I come to you and I'm telling you, I don't know what to do. Can you teach me? Can you teach me how to know the difference between good and bad? And it says in verse 10 that the Lord was pleased. It really, it actually says that he was, he was told, like he was, it was good to him that he asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for all this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor. And in your lifetime, you have no equals among kings. This is sounding really good, if you're Solomon. Like he, he wished right. Good job. But then there's this one word that in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it's tough. If. If is such a contingent word. I'm going to do all this. I'm going to do all this for you, Solomon. I'm going to do all this. You're going to have all this. If. You walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did. I will give you long life. Boy, there's so much here. If, there's also something just, I don't have time to get into it, but for something for you to dwell on. I often think about how it talks about David and says, I want you to keep the commandments like David kept. And if I was Solomon, I'd be like, which commands did he actually keep? <laughs> he was a murderer, an adulterer, a thief, a coveter. Like, which ones did he keep? But somehow God remembers him differently. Sometimes you think, God, do you remember David? <laughs> do you remember what he did? Because he, apparently he, he does, but it's like what he says about David is very different than what he's going to say about Solomon. I will give you an if. If. But in this moment, at this time, Solomon chooses to eat from the tree of life. And he says, I want to have you teach me through intimacy how to know the difference between good and bad because you're calling me to rule and to reign and I need wisdom to be able to do that because your heart, God, is for justice. And so here we are in this place. It's also interesting, just side note, it was actually, this was in a vision in a dream and you have to remember when he is bringing wisdom to Solomon in a dream and God brought Eve to Adam when he was asleep because the reality is this is the same picture that he's bringing wisdom to Solomon as the azer that he needs, the thing that he cannot accomplish by himself. He's bringing wisdom, lady wisdom, he's bringing to Solomon in his sleep. And he wakes up and he thinks, oh man, this is going to be great. I just have to keep the first guy, I just have to keep the commands. What are the commands? Well, we got the whole, we got everything. But maybe sometimes you just kind of keep going backwards and backwards and backwards and we remember that the first command that was given to anyone, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But let's see what Solomon does. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 25, it says, during Solomon's life, Judah and Israel from Dan to Beersheba lived in safety. Everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. I love it. It's like everyone is in the garden. Everyone's seeing fruitfulness. Every, everyone is seeing this incredible thing. Like everyone is, is in this land of plenty in which we have new gardens springing up. Whenever you get to Ecclesiastes, Solomon says, like, I made gardens in the wastelands. I made a new Eden. Like, this is what I did. 
Everyone was sitting on their own vine or fig tree. In verse, in verse 29 of chapter 4, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great, great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom in Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Israelite. He was wiser than He-Man. Come on, He-Man. Uh, Kalkal and Darda and the sons of Mahal. And it, you didn't know He-Man was in the Bible, did you? And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. This is, I love this because, just remember, it says he spoke about plant life. Another version said he knew all about the trees. From the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls, he also spoke about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. The entire Eden creation story. So this is New Eden, and this is Adam, who's trying to bring back Paradise Lost. So you know what? It says people from all nations came listening to Solomon's wisdom, sent by kings of the world who had heard of his wisdoms. All four books of, of wisdom are, are mentioned here. Uh, when it says that he exceeds the knowledge of the East, that's talking about the book of Job. Job was from the East, and he represents the entire Eastern knowledge uh, that comes down from us. And then Ecclesiastes is, is, is the, the concept of all these different kings in the past and what's been learned by the great thinkers. And then, of course, he wrote his Proverbs and songs. The 1,005 songs that he wrote are in the songs of Solomon. They're all mentioned here in this verse. And then culminating a few chapters later in, in chapter 10 when everything's looking good and there's prosperity and there's safety and there's abundance and everyone's sitting on their own vine and fig tree and you're like, man, this is looking good. All of a sudden, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, when the queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's fame, which brought honor to the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. Uh-oh. A woman. A woman's coming to test him. A woman who doesn't need Solomon. A woman who's a queen. A woman who is his equal. A woman who brought her own gold and her own people and her own thing. A woman who is ruling on her own. A woman comes and represents a test for Solomon. A woman comes and says, I'm gonna ask you these questions. And what we know about Solomon, because you know the story, you've read it, like he didn't do very good with tests with women. But in this case, this queen of Sheba, this, this character came and she said she came and the Bible says you, you're getting nervous because you're like, man, there's some kind of chemistry, there's some sparks. This could not end good for Solomon. And yet it says that he withheld no good thing from her, no wisdom, and they discussed. And at the end of their story, of their interaction in verse 9, it says, this is the queen of Sheba speaking. It says, praise the Lord your God who delights in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king so you can rule with justice and righteousness. And all of a sudden we have this time, we have this moment where Israel is prosperous and everyone's in a garden and things are great. He knows all about the trees and all about the animals. And he's here with this woman who also is powerful and who's brought this idea and he's passed this test. He had an opportunity to do what he thought was right. He had an opportunity to do something different and he chose instead to glorify God and the result was righteousness and justice is reigning and you think oh my gosh they've done it they're here he's made a way the promise was fulfilled but we still have this word if if and the whole story of Solomon is almost like a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde there's two Solomons that we see and we have to go back and we have to rewind and we have to see some other things that were happening at the, the same time. And that although in this moment it looks like everything's great and we have this man and woman living in this co-ruling existence where God is being glorified, we have to go back. First Kings chapter 5, it says that King Solomon conscripted a labor force of 30,000 men. And then it goes on to talk about all these different people and all this stuff and how many would go there. And there was 3,600 foremen and supervisors. And when you hear constricted a labor force, you're like, yeah, that's what you do when you're wise. You see, the way it works is when you're wise and you're smart, like you, you're a manager. And then you have people under them. And then you, like, you, divert, you create a hierarchy chain for maximum efficiency. That's called wisdom. 
Conscripted labor is just a really polite word that actually is just slave labor. He got slaves. Some of them were his own people. And then he put overseers over them. You're going to start to hear as we read a bunch of Egypt terminology that all of a sudden is going to start raising its head of slavery and overseers and conscription and work. And so he, he gets all these people, and apparently not everyone was sitting on their own vine and fig tree. Like, everyone who had a vine and fig tree were great, and then also then there was slaves who didn't have a vine or fig tree because they were too busy working and building all this stuff. And then it says that he built the entire town centers to, to house all of his chariots and all of his horses and all of his stuff, and everything that he wanted was great. That's in First Kings chapter 9. And, and here's the thing. I, I, I'm on a... Maybe you would say, if I just read 1 Kings, it's not a big deal. God's blessing him. He's prosperous. He's got money. And so he's buying things like chariots and horses and stuff because he's got money because God's blessing him. If he didn't have money, money is a sure sign that God's blessing you, right? Right? Like, if you've got a lot of money, God must love you. He's got a lot of money, so he's using it. He's buying stuff. But I'm always faced with two decisions. Do I understand from intimacy or what I think is right? God told me to do something. Maybe we need to go back to Deuteronomy because Moses wrote some things down. He said, you don't ever need to get a king, but if you get a king, let me tell you what a king needs to do and what a king not, that needs to not do. Verse 16 of Deuteronomy 17, it says, the king must not build a large stable of horses for himself. Oops. Or send his people to Egypt to buy horses. Well, I don't know if he's done that yet. We'll find out. The Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself. The king must not take many wives for himself. Do you think 700 is many? Maybe there's like a translation error. I don't know. Because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. Oh. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. What it goes on to say is like basically what a king should do is he should sit down and he should copy the rule of, rules of the law and he should read it to himself over and over again because if he doesn't keep reminding himself that he needs to choose God's way and he doesn't need to do it his own way, he will forget and he will do what is right in his own eyes and he will forget his purpose and the result will end up in pain, separation, broken relationships, and death. 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, it says, The weight of the gold that Solomon received every year was six, six. Oh, man, that's a bad number, people. It's not used very many times. In fact, I believe this is the only time it's used outside of Revelation or a book of prophecy, whether it be Daniel or any of those things, speaking of end times. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, though. All the King Solomon's goblets were gold and all the household articles in the palace of the forest of Lebanon. That's what he decided to call his palace, the forest of Lebanon. They were all pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's day. Silver disgusted himself. Later it says that silver was as plentiful as stones. The king had a fleet of trading ships. He's the only king to have a navy. And you think, was he fighting battles and keeping corruption off of the sea? And it says every three years it returned carrying gold, silver, ivory, apes, and baboons. Mike Tyson wasn't the first person to buy a tiger with his money. Like Solomon was like, I'm buying some apes and baboons with my gold because why not? This is when it gets real bad. Solomon accumulated chariots and horses and had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. Man, it said specifically, don't do that. Which he kept in his chariot cities. Oh, he built cities for them. Cool. Also in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones and cedar as plentiful as sycamore and fig trees in the foothills. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt. From Egypt? One place God said not to buy horses from. But Solomon knows better. He's wise, right? And Q and the royal merchant purchased them from Q at the current price. They imported the chariot from Egypt at 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. They also exported them to the king of Hittites and the Amorians. You think, yeah, he's a businessman. No, that's called an arms dealer. <laughs> Chariots are not transportation. These are like tanks. So now he's an arms dealer. Hmm. It's rough. He's doing exactly what he said not to do. 
he's all of a sudden doing what he thinks is right in his own eyes, not what is right in God's way. And then we get to the really heartbreaking part of the story in 1 Kings chapter 11. Remember how 1 Kings chapter 3, it says that Solomon loved God. Now, but a little bit of time and a little bit of gold, a little bit of horses, a little bit of this. It says in verse 1, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. And here's the thing, full disclosure, I'm not, a, like, I am actually pro-loving foreign women myself. <laughs> but it's a different time. My wife's from Columbia, for those of you who are like, what a weirdo. My wife's a foreign woman. I love her. One woman. <laughs> Besides Pharaoh's daughter, oh, you mean he married an Egyptian. He married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from the other Hittites. We don't have time to get into it, but every single one of those tribes, like every single one of those, God said, don't marry them. Verse 3, it says he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. In Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Solomon worshipped Asherah, the goddess of the Sidians, Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. In this way, Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight, for he refused to follow the Lord completely as his father David did. On the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, he even built a pagan shrine for Chemos, the detestable god of Moab, and another for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Solomon built such shrines for all his foreign wives to, bring, to use for burning incense and sacrificing to their gods. In just a few chapters and just a few times, we go from Solomon loving God and offering sacrifices to him on high places and creating fruitfulness for everyone to now Solomon loves foreign women. He's created false Edoms on other hilltops where other people can go and offer sacrifices to fake gods. Because at some point in his life, at some point in this duopoly, he stopped taking from the tree of life and letting God define what was right and wrong. And instead, he took it into his own mind that he knew better and he was going to define what was right and wrong. And the end result is he turned away from God and he lost everything. And so when we get this opportunity and we get to read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon and then Job, when we get to read all these, especially the first three, we're going to see that his entire life and the language of who he is is going to come out and we're going to see these books in a new light that we haven't ever seen them before. Because Solomon lost everything. Israel lost everything. And all of his wisdom and all of his goodness and everything that he had was for nothing because he chose to do it in his own way in the end as opposed to choosing to do it the way that God intended. But there's good news. And Samuel, when the promise of a seed and the promise of a temple and the promise of place was being given, they were never speaking of Solomon. They were never referring to what Solomon would do because Solomon is a man in which if could not be overcome. But there was a seed that was coming that was going to be a result of something greater that came from the line of David that never came from the line of Solomon. There was a seed that was coming that was going to be greater than Solomon. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, Jesus says, The queen of Sheba will also stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon, but now someone greater than Solomon is here. Now someone greater than Solomon is here. Now Jesus says on top of everything that he claims about himself, he says now someone greater than Solomon is here. Now someone who's greater than the wisest man to ever walk the earth is here. Because there's a difference between me and Solomon. The difference is, is I can handle the if and Solomon can't. The difference is I grew in intimacy with God at the very foot of where he was. At the beginning in creation, I knew what he wanted. And you know, there's no there's no. There's no happenstance in the Bible. Do you remember when Jesus, where he kept going back to pray? In intimacy with God? The Mount of Olives. The place where Solomon, the wisest man in the world, made shrines for other gods was the place where Jesus went back to redeem in relationship and intimacy with God. It's 
said, someone greater than Solomon's coming. Someone greater than Solomon's coming. Someone who's going to make a dwelling place for God where God wants to dwell. Someone who says, I'm going to make a dwelling place that's not made of stone, it's not made of gold, it's not made of wood. The reality is the dwelling place that I long to be in is the place where you are. I long to dwell in relationship with you. And my home is made permanently with you. And you carry me with you everywhere that you go. And as a result, you have greater than Solomon living inside of you, ready to breathe life and speak wisdom into your situation that is beyond comparison that is greater than the wisdom in the east, that is greater than the books of Proverbs, that is greater than the songs of Solomon, that's greater than everything that was written by man, because there is something about the one who is greater than Solomon who wants to live inside of you, who wants to breathe life and speak wisdom into your situation that you carry every single step. And whether it has to do with finances or your relationships or your marriage or children, he has the wisdom that you need that comes out of intimacy, of being one with Jesus. He said, the enemy is broken, but I fixed it. The enemy broke it, I fixed it. The enemy took what was supposed to be between one man and one woman. He broke it. That's why when people say, oh, the Bible has a lot of things about polygamy and different things. And like, he doesn't ever specifically say, listen, the the Bible may not, may, may not say, hey, only marry one person. All it does in context is show you that every single person who married more than one person, it never worked out good, ever, ever, ever. Anytime there was a marriage that was ever more than one man and one woman, the result was pain, chaos, conflict, bad. The worst of which was Solomon. Because that's why in Genesis it says, for this reason, for this reason, for this reason, one man will leave his family and be joined in intimacy to one woman so that they will understand the intimacy that God longs to have with them within each other. That in this relationship of one man and one woman, that the result is fruitfulness of children. The result of that is that we would know how good God is. And now we have Jesus who's greater than Solomon who said, I came and I lived and I fulfilled the if and I followed all the commandments and I never, even though I was offered, I never ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I only ate from the tree of life. And as a result, you have life that's living inside of you and wisdom is calling from inside of your heart. Now we have Jesus. And he longs to have intimacy with you. And from intimacy, he longs to teach you the difference between good and bad so that you can be prosperous so that you can see abundance, so that you can sit under your own vine and fig tree and, and be in intimate relationship with God. And in the cool of the evening, he can come and speak with you and speak life to your situation and hope to the hopeless and can tell you it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Just know that I'm here with you. We have Jesus. And now as we start next week and we push into the actual wisdom literature, and we start looking at Proverbs, we'll have this base and this understanding that we're at this precipice of a choice of who we decide to be, but we know that Jesus has already made a way for us to walk in eternal intimacy with him that will never be taken away. Because Jesus made a way where there was no way. And all of scripture and all of the wisdom literature and everything is pointing to who he is and the wisdom that you get to carry in your heart. As a church, I cannot wait till we get to start looking at Proverbs. In fact, I encourage you this week, read some Proverbs, read some uh, uh, Song of Solomon, read some Job, read Ecclesiastes, read it in a new light and begin to see the language that God is doing and the, and the, the, the way that God is connecting stories. And at the core of all is his desire to rule and reign in relationship with you in intimacy, to teach you the difference between good and bad. And for you to know it may not look like what man says, but what God says will always benefit you and will be profitable to the things that he desires for your life. Let me pray over your church. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word that is true, that is alive, that is living, Father God, with hope and wisdom. 
Lord, as we continue to walk through this, I just thank you, Lord, that your spirit, that your wisdom continues to fill in the pieces that I'm missing, to make clear the things that are unclear, that it continues to guide us and to lead us into our everyday lives. Lord, we desire and long to be in relationship with you. Thank you that today, as we're here, Jesus paid the price that Jesus made a way, that Jesus lived up to the if so that we could have wisdom with us every day of our lives. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hey, listen, church, one, one more thing before we end and we dismiss, or I guess two things. If you need prayer, maybe you, you need to stand in for someone who's sick. Maybe you want to have questions about what it means to accept Jesus. Uh, maybe you just have other things in your life that you want someone to pray for. Our prayer team is going to be down here at the front, and you can be down here, and they would love to pray for you. And for the rest of you, man, I want to encourage you, don't miss next week. I'm telling you, everything about this series will build and build, and it'll be good. It'll be fruitful. It'll be profitable. And if you say, man, there was a lot today. Yeah, there was a lot today. Listen to it again. Get into it, because I'm telling you, the end result will you be will be you being able to see and hear the voice of God from a completely different perspective, and I believe it'll bless you in your daily life. Listen, you are loved, you are prayed for, and now you are officially dismissed. Have a great rest of your Labor Day weekend. We'll see you next week.